If you will, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke once again. Uh, Luke chapter 20. Uh, we'll read in just a moment verses 1 through 18. Again, uh, the Gospel of Luke uh, chapter 20. Uh, we'll begin in verse 1. If you can remember from last week, I began the sermon by reading from Luke's account of the burial of the Lord Jesus. And then I ask the question, how could it be? How is it that that which began on what we think of as Palm Sunday, uh, the, what sometimes is referred to as the triumphal entry, the, all of this affirmation and all of these accolades concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, how did uh, that which began with uh, such great fanfare and such high expectations, how did it uh, decline and devolve to the place in which those very people who were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is our King. How could those very same people, most likely, by the end of the week be shouting, crucify him? We have no king but Caesar. And so today we begin to trace out uh, that, uh, that week, sometimes we refer to it as, as Passion Week, the week in which uh, all of the controversies that, that stoked the very consternation of the religious uh, leaders there in Jerusalem, whether they were the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees, the whole lot of them. They all became increasingly hostile to the point to which they would carry out their conspiracy that had been in the works for some time. But this week, with Jesus there present uh, over the course of the celebration of the, of the Passover, they would actually bring to fruition what they had conceived within the darkness of of their own hearts. They would place our Lord and our Savior on the cross. But un unknown to them, God was not silent. And God was at work in all of these things to actually accomplish our redemption. And so let's look beginning uh, there in verse 1 and let's think about all of these events that was a part of God's plan to place His Son on the cross for the accomplishment of our salvation. Read with me. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priest and the scribes with the elders came up and said to Him, Tell us by what authority you do these things. Or who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, well, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered him and that they did not know where it came from. Jesus said to them, well, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one they wounded and cast out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. 
what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is that is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Pray with me. Father, again, we thank you for your word. It is truth. It is the, the truth by which you have revealed yourself to us as our God, as our Creator, as our Savior. And we thank you that you have seen fit that it be preserved for us and it be proclaimed among us and that through this message of the gospel you would save us. I pray that your spirit would be at work today in me to give me clarity of thought and speech and to give those who hear today that they would have a clarity of understanding that, that you would, by your spirit, apply your truth to each of our lives for, for our good and for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have come to what is now this third section of the Gospel of Luke. We saw the first nine chapters, first eight chapters, uh, dealt with the beginnings of the ministry, the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as we moved into chapter 9, we saw that Jesus became very focused. We're told that he set his face toward Jerusalem. He knew what lie ahead of him. He knew what his destiny was ultimately going to be. And so he steadfastly pursued, moved toward that ordained ends. And so now, having entered Jerusalem, we are ready, prepared for the, the final episode, the final uh, chapter of this story of God's Son and His work in this world. He uh, announces by the, His entrance into Jerusalem that indeed He is the long-awaited King. He is the one that the prophets had anticipated, that they had looked forward to. I indeed, He is, he is the, the, the true prophet, the prophet like unto Moses. And he is the priest who has authority though not recognized over all matters pertaining to God, inclusive of that temple that existed at that time in Jerusalem. And so we're told that he enters that temple after uh, uh, coming into Jerusalem, and most people will say something along the lines of he cleansed the temple, which is actually a second cleansing. John tells us that Early in his public ministry, on another Passover, he enters in and he, he cleanses, he, he, he denounces that which is the normative practice within uh, that temple. And so once again, he enters the temple for that same reason, to express his outrage over what had uh, come to pass, over how uh, the temple had come to be abused, that the, the truth that God had given for the salvation of men was being distorted and undermined by the very practice of those to whom God had entrusted these very truths. And so after this cleansing, after Jesus had kicked the proverbial anthill or the proverbial hornet's nest, he returns to the scene of the crime. Now, possibly there were some gathered there that may have forgotten that Jesus had once before cleansed the temple. Certainly, it was probably forgotten that 20 years prior, there was a 12-year-old that had sat among them and amazed them with his understanding, with his, with his insight, with his grasp of the truth that went beyond anything that they had learned or anything that they had said. And so Jesus once again comes into the, the temple probably on Monday or Tuesday of that final week. Sometimes we refer to it as, as Passion Week. And we are told that, that he is teaching the people 
and preaching the gospel. And while doing that, he is going to suffer the interruption of the religious leaders. Now, one thing that Luke certainly does, I, I think probably the other gospel writers do this as well, that they will often note Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Jesus is speaking to the crowds, uh, to the people, to, to various uh, groups, uh, just to, to note that, that uh, what type of audience Jesus has. And so he says that Jesus is teaching the people, presumably a group made up of disciples, uh, both the twelve and beyond. Some were probably earnest seekers, hopefully on the journey to, to full commitment and belief in this Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some were probably what I sometimes call old covenant saints, that, that, uh, that they were actually converted, they were regenerate, and they came to understand this is what we were, this is the one. He is the one we are, have been looking forward to. This, this is the one to whom all of the scriptures had given testimony. Indeed, he is the Christ. There were those that were certainly skeptical and certainly would stand in opposition to all that Jesus would teach. And so it was a, a mixed crowd that Jesus was teaching there in the temple precincts. And we're told that he is teaching and preaching. Those two things go together, okay? Now, when I think of teaching, I'm thinking largely of the communication, the, uh, the, uh, the transforming of, of a certain level of content or, or information. This is, this is a body of truth, and I, I want to, to give it to you in a way that you come to understand it. And then it says he is preaching the gospel or preaching the good news. When we think of preaching, we're, we're thinking about a, a call to action. We're thinking about the, the reality of, of, of exhortation, uh, the, 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 the command to repent and believe with, with Christ at the very center of that which is preached. And you'll often hear me say that the best teaching has an element of preaching in it, in other words, in, in, certainly in, in, in the realm of, of the church, when we're imparting information, it is to provide for you uh, su suitable information, the background, the framework, where you can come to either initially believe unto salvation, or whether your faith can be refined, it can be honed, it can be enhanced, so that you see the greatness of the gospel that has been given to you through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're constantly imparting information for the sake of your appreciation of the grandeur of the accomplishment of Christ. And so in preaching, we're also giving you information, again, with the emphasis being upon you must respond to this truth. Now, again, same thing in teaching. You've got to respond to that truth. You've got to embrace it. You have to own it. Now, please hear me. You've heard me say this many times, but I want to say it again. You will respond to the proclamation, to the preaching of the truth. And you'll respond in one or two ways. It will be either yes, Lord, or no, Lord. Not K-N-O-W, but no. There's only two possible responses that you will make to what you hear here today. For any and all, the appropriate response is always, every time you come to the Word, is to repent and to believe. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And so we preach and we teach. We, we seek to give you an understanding whether, you're in the, in, whether your present state is that of unbelief we, we talk to you about the, the reality of your inability. We speak to you about your 
unwillingness to embrace the truth, that, that, that you do not want to repent and believe, you do not want to submit to the Lordship of Christ. We, we teach you about all of the, the great realities of, of God and the tragedy of man and his rebellion and the impact of, of sin and the necessity of salvation. We, we try to build a framework around the realities of there is a Creator, the reality of a creation demands that there be a creator. That's pretty simple, folks. You need to own that. You need, you need to really drill down on that, that there is a reality. I guess the right term wouldn't be there's a, re, re, uh, a real ter, But behind reality is the ultimate reality, the creator, God. And so creation, again, the impact of rebellion this necessity regarding redemption, salvation. And then how does it all end? The consummation of all things. So we're constantly giving you these building blocks so that you constantly are having a, an enhanced view of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as he taught on that day, I feel quite sure just based on what we see as the controversies escalate and their consternation continues to rise then he talked to the people about the fact you see these religious leaders there's some scribes there's some pharisees there's some sadducees there's the high priest sitting right there they are oppressing you they are corrupting the truth they they they, they actually by, by virtue of making you a proselyte, by you coming to embrace what they're saying to you, they are making you twice as much a son of hell as you were previously. I'm quite sure all of those things were being taught and that presumably these were Jews sitting there who had some level of agreement about certain historical realities about God and creation. But I'm sure Jesus was beginning to tell them, I am the fulfillment of everything that has been said to you from the Old Covenant. And here's what's about to happen. And it's going to happen so that you may be saved. That is, this group, these Sadducees and scribes and Pharisees and all of these religious leaders, the, the, the chief priests, the, 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 the uh, elders of the people, they're going to conspire and kill me. That's what's going to happen here, folks. I mean, they're sitting there kind of biding their time a little bit right now, probably scowling like some of y'all do at me sometimes. No, I'm kidding. Scowling, gritting their teeth. When's this guy going to shut up? What are we going to do to get rid of him? I've known since that Lazarus business we were going to have to kill him. He said, those guys, they're going to kill me. But don't worry. Three days later, for the very sake of your salvation, for this, of this gospel that I'm proclaiming to you, I will be raised from the dead. They, they'll have a say. But it won't be the final say. And so Jesus is teaching and preaching. And while teaching and preaching, the, the, this group interrupts him with, with a question there in verse 2. Tell us by what authority you do these things. Now, in other words, who in the world do you think you are? Who died and made you king? I was born a king, thank you very much. What, what rabbinical school has placed their stamp of approval upon your instruction, your, your claim to authority? I mean, you disrupted everything in here. Who do you think you are? So by what authority you, do you do these things, plural? By what authority? You, I mean, we've been following you for a while. You've trampled over the Sabbath. You have claimed to forgive sins. 
Some way or another, there was this business about Lazarus. Uh, we're, not, we're not real clear on that. You parade in here like you're somebody letting the masses celebrate your arrival. Then you come clean house in the precincts that we're in charge of. Just who do you think you are? And so they ask him that, que that question, and then in some sense, they're establishing, you're not the authority here, we're the authority here. Of course, they don't know that it's vice versa. They don't, they don't recognize that indeed they don't have any power and no authority in light of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus responds to them in verses 3 and 4 by way of a question. Too many times, Jesus indeed is, is gentle and lowly. He is meek and mild. Those things are true. But he didn't take everything lying down. In other words, he, oh, well, these, these guys, you know, they're, they're kind of in authority. They've got a lot of power. I better sit up and pay attention. Now, I think he was saying, you think you have authority I'm going to respond to you in kind. I'm not going to answer you directly. I could say, the authority is this. I was conceived of a virgin by the Holy Spirit. I am uniquely the Son of God. I am the promised King of David. I am the priest and the prophet who fulfills all things. And this is my Father's house. And I have every right to stand right here. And I'm here to straighten you out. It would have been perfectly just to say that. Right? But he says, listen, let me ask you a question. You want to ask me a question? I'll ask you a question. We're on equal footing here. You're, you're not going to railroad me out of town. And so he returns by answering to them, answering them a question. And instead of saying something like what I just said, he, in a sense, maybe puts off the answer a bit. Because while Jesus is pursuing his ordained end, make no mistake about it, he's the one mashing the accelerator. He could, he, could have, he could have poured gas on their fire right there and brought it all to a quick end. But the appointed means to his appointed ends is for this slow escalation so that he would be placed on the cross on the day of the Passover so that he would be that Lamb of God, that ultimate Passover Lamb slain from the foundation of the world through which He would redeem those who believe from their slavery. And so, He answers them with a question of His own. And so, He asks them the question regarding John. Interesting thing, interesting place to go. I will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven are from man. Let's talk about this issue of John the Baptist, the, the late uh, John the Baptist. And when he asked them that question, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they, re they realize that he's hooked them on the horns of a dilemma. They, they, they are caught between a rock and a hard place. Now it's interesting, and, and it, it, it really came to me late in the process of, of studying, how does Luke know what they talked about in response to this question? Now, I don't know. But maybe Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea might have been a party to this discussion. And later they said, let me tell you, those guys were upset. Those guys, let me tell you what we talked about. They, they, they did not know what to do. They were like, well, you know, you know, they're scratching their head and they're like, well, if we say that he really was a messenger from God, then why are you still behaving the way you're behaving? Why didn't you believe Him? Why didn't you re repent? And then, and I think probably a bit of overstatement, I think, you know, kind of by way of exaggeration here, well, if we just say He was a man, they'll stone us. Uh, again, I think, I think probably just they were being a little bit facetious, exaggerating a bit what might have happened, but they knew that if they were going to remain popular, popular, if they were going to maintain their popular status, 
then there was a certain way that John was seen as a bit of a, a folk hero at the very least, if not a prophet from God. And so uh, they knew that they were trapped and they could not give an answer to uh, the particular question. And so we don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Kind of like some of us sometimes. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. That was their answer. And so again, Jesus, okay, fine. I'm not going to answer you. You don't answer me, I won't answer you. Tit for tat. Again, instead of, you know, oh, I know I need to answer you guys. Let me see if I can explain something. You can, no. No, okay. I know what you're doing. I'm not going to cooperate with you. And so you refuse to answer me. Same thing here. I refuse to answer you. And so, I'm not going to tell you. But here's what I'm going to do. As he did so often. I'm going to tell you a story. And in this story, and they got it, there's a pointed indictment of this group by the Savior. We see this story, the, sometimes simply the, the parable of the tenants, I think, Typically, some way that it's titled. There is a, a vineyard representing Israel, most prominently, probably coming out of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, that, that Israel is the Lord's vineyard, and he was disappointed uh, in the productivity of that particular vineyard. And so, right away, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they know. Okay, something's coming our way. So there's a vineyard. There's a man who owns the vineyard, who represents God. There are tenants of that vineyard who represent the, the leadership there within Israel, that, that religious aristocracy. And there are servants that are sent by the landowner that represent the, the prophets down through the course of history that had been come. They had come to warn the nation of their sin and their rebellion. And so uh, the story goes that the, the landowner has planted this vineyard and he leases it out. He works out a sharecropping type of arrangement. Probably most of you are kind of familiar with people working a land that doesn't own to them and the way that they uh, uh, sustain themselves and, 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 and pay the rent is by sharing with the harvest. And so we're told that the harvest time came, and so the landowner rightfully chooses to exercise his rights to, to, to a portion uh, of the fruit of that vineyard. And so he sent someone to go and to uh, receive that fruit for him, and they beat him. And they sent him away empty-handed. And, and he returns, I'm sure, to the, to the landowner and tells him what happened. And in verse 11, we're told that the second servant is, hit, is sent. And they treat him terribly as well. And they send him away. And then yet a, again, a, a third, representing again the ongoing, the continual reality of the prophets constantly coming to the nation and constantly being persecuted, constantly being rejected, constantly being turned away by the people. And so after the, the third servant is sent, we're given some insight to the thinking of the landowner there in verse 13. Then the owner of the vineyard says, What shall I do? Now, when you're teaching or preaching, when you're communicating, it's always good to ask a question. So you're sitting there daydreaming. You're thinking about this, that, and the other. And then if I ask you a question, particularly if I attach your name to the question. No, I'm kidding. If I ask you a question, the goal is what? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me, let me, let me engage in this. Let me think this through. And so if you weren't listening, religious leaders, what would you say, what should the landowner do in view of the particular circumstances that I've communicated within the story? And so Jesus goes on to tell, this is what is going to be done. I'm going to send my beloved son. Who is the beloved son, or who does the beloved son represent? None other than the Son of God sent into the vineyard. That is Israel. And so when they see the Son, 
they conspire. They think within themselves, this is the landowner's son. If we kill him, then he will no longer have a right of inheritance. And what? It will all be ours. They have a, a scheme, a scheme that will result in their acquisition of the land. And then Jesus asked them a, a second question. In verse 15, after killing the son, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? What should he do? This is what he did. This is what they did. Now, in view of all of these events, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? I'm sure a, a pause. Think about it. How would you respond to those that have murdered your son? And then Jesus, before they can answer, He answers His own question there again in verse 16. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And I believe at that point, they realize very precisely this is an indictment of them. This is a story that represents the history of the nation and its descent into really what amounted to apostasy. They had so distorted and they had so perverted that which God had revealed to them that it was no longer useful to bring the truth about God to the people for their salvation. And so when Jesus answers, they go, surely not! Because what? They are entrapped. They know that they indeed are those tenants that have been violent and unfaithful. They are the ones that have denied the rightful access to the fruit of the, or the pro produce of the vineyards. And so they, they shout out, sure, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You, okay, the parable has brought some clarity to what you're saying and we don't want to own it. We don't want to be identified with the tenants. Surely not. That's, that's not what's going to happen. Not, not destruction. Not judgment. The parable reminds me a bit of the parable that Nathan comes to tell David after his great fall into immorality. And Nathan tells him a parable or a story about a, a man who owns one single lamb that he cherished that someone that a neighbor takes and slaughters and eats and 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 when david hears it he is he is angered and he says oh what i, I I'll, I'll bring justice to 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 this family I, I i will bring justice to the one who killed this one man's beloved lamb and nathan says you king david are the man david got the point and at that point he was convicted of his sin and his rebellion and he began that great and deep work of repentance that is so well stated in Psalm 51. The difference here is what? They realized they were the man. But unlike David, they refused to repent. They remained hardened in their opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus moves from the rejected son to the rejected stone. And he appeals to uh, the psalm, Psalm 118, part of what maybe they were singing when he entered uh, Jerusalem. And so we see this third thing, the illustration of condemnation. But in this illustration of condemnation, there's also the illustration of redemption. And so Jesus says... Quoting the psalm, Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That, that, that the reality is that that which God is going to do, He is going to do through one who has been rejected. I think back to so many times starting the foundation of a house and the corners were so crucial. Does anybody know the rule of 6-8-10? Otherwise known as the Pythagorean theorem. 
I'll, uh, ask me after church and I'll explain it to you. But that's how you ensure that the corners are square. The corners must be square for the walls to be straight. The walls of the church, the proclamation of the apostles. Rightly joined to the cornerstone, the rejected stone, rightly joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it seemed like the apostles really liked this image. Both Paul and Peter build on it to some extent. And, and Peter will, will tell us that, that we, the believer, are actually living stones being built upon this foundation of the apostles and their proclamation of the gospel, the gospel being that of the cornerstone who was rejected. The cornerstone, by his rejection, will accomplish our redemption. He is rejected by those leaders placed on the cross. By that rejection, he purchases our redemption. And so, we see here salvation accomplished by the rejection. Again, Peter picks up on it at Pentecost. He says, listen, this has all happened according to God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you wicked men were willing participants. That was the agency by which the Son of God was placed on the cross. By your rebellion, redemption was accomplished. By this act of rejection, the one that was unfit to be built upon is the very foundational, most essential component of the construction of that which will be the church. Now we could say a lot, I wish we had a little more time, but let me just say this. Jesus could speak of the dismantling, the destruction of the temple. We'll see that later. Because what Jesus, the cornerstone of the building that Jesus was building was not a building of brick and mortar. It was nothing built by the hands of men. It was a spiritual building built with living stones through the power of the gospel and the working of of the Spirit. And so he tells them that this is the way this is all going to work out. You're going to reject me, but your rejection will serve God's ultimate purpose. And here's a final warning related to this cornerstone. Two warnings of judgment. Now I must tell you that for a good number of years I have taught verse 18 as contrasting parallel statements that those that fall represent those that come to Christ for repentance and those that are the, the stone falls on are crushed in uh, condemnation. I haven't found a single commentary. I haven't found a shred of evidence that anybody's ever believed that, so I repent. It is a parallel statement. Two ways of expressing the reality of those that reject the cornerstone either will fall on it and be crushed or it will fall on them and they will be crushed under the weight of the condemnation of Almighty God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an awful picture of the coming judgment. And so Jesus says something to them. They quiz Him. They question, what do you do and who do you think you are? And Jesus levels an indictment against them. You are these murderous tenants that have been entrusted with much. And you're going to reject the sun. You're going to reject the cornerstone. But be sure of this, that in your doing that, God's plan will not be thwarted and it will not be frustrated. The one that you rejected. Should you persist in your rebellion, will be the one who crushes you in judgment. And so, as we think about this this morning, are you a living stone? Rightly built upon the truth, the truth of the gospel, with the, the, the very most essential element of the gospel being what? The cornerstone, 
the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. He indeed was in His rightful place doing what He had every right to do. Preaching and teaching. Calling for repentance and informing this is how all things have come to pass and this is where they're going. And this is why you need to be warned. There's salvation that's available, but there's a judgment that's coming as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for the truth of your gospel. Lord, as we enter into this celebration of what we call the Lord's Supper, uh, Lord, we, we pray that the truth of your gospel would indeed once again, in, in, in this drama that unfolds, would be put on display for the good of our souls. Amen. I'm going to ask our deacons who will be serving this morning to go ahead and move forward to the, to the front row. And if you can do that kind of quietly with as kind of little disturbance as possible, I, I ask of those that are here to begin to think, and if I could call your attention to what we've been doing as we transition towards the table. We can say that we have been invited to the king's banquet by the king. It is upon his authority that we've come to his table. And he has provided even the appropriate garments. The garments of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ by which we may partake. He is the prophet who has called us to repentance. In faith, He has exposed our sin, which is always a painful thing for the sake of our repentance. He is the priest that offered the sacrifice that as the cornerstone being rejected provided the very cornerstone of our salvation in His person and in His work. And so He invites us to come to his table, to this table, and to remember his accomplishment on the cross for us. It's always appropriate that we say a word and in the old days they would talk about fencing the Lord's table. What does that mean? What am I talking about? First of all, let me say, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether or not you are a member of North Clay Baptist or not, if you are a believer, you're welcome to come and take. The King has invited you to His table. But it's always appropriate as well if you are a non-believer. If you still persist in your rebellion, beware. Be very careful. These, this, these same elements that, that are a means of grace for the believer and a source of encouragement, a testimony to the gospel, will be a testimony to your very condemnation. That's the way the Apostle Paul describes it. He calls upon us to examine ourselves. And even those of us that are believers, I believe that examination to see whether or not we're of the faith is both First and foremost, are you a Christian? And are things right between me and my Savior? Now, if your claim is, yes, indeed, things are right between me and my Savior, by definition, things are right between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? And so, he says, examining yourself with this stern warning to the Corinthian church, but it's supplied for 2,000 years. Be careful. There's some that have become sick. Some have even gone to sleep because of their neglect and their abuse of this thing that we call the Lord's table. And so let's pray together as we prepare to take these elements. 
Father, we thank you for the truth, for the power, for the goodness of your grace. Lord, we come to this table in and of ourselves. We are all unworthy. And we confess that. And we have only been made worthy by the invitation, by the work of our King. We thank you that he indeed has clothed us in these robes of righteousness. And so may we come and may we enjoy. And for those that may think I am outside of this, this realm, I, I don't need to partake, I pray that this moment would drive them to genuine, to true repentance. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.